Hello, and welcome to TESPA Training Ground, day two of week four. I'm Robert Wertherwing, joined at the desk by Keaton Chalky Gill. This is obviously the second day of this week, and we've got three more teams, or rather six more teams, looking to go ahead and earn their spot in the regional playoff afterwards. But Keaton, before we get to that, you're really dressed up nice today. You too. Yeah, it's... You know, we, we went ahead, we went the extra mile today. Yeah. yeah. May, may or may not have been, you know... Well, told, I look like a tablecloth. ...told to do this. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, this is, no, no, no. This is free will. Free will. It's all initiative. Help us. <laughs> Please. But before you help us, get to know the format for TESPA Training Ground. So we begin with the regional groups, which we're currently at. Teams split into one of four regional Swiss groups and play one match a week. And then the regional playoffs, teams with four or more wins advance into single elimination playoffs. We had three teams qualify yesterday. We're going to have another three qualify for the playoffs today, and they will be battling eventually for a place in the live finals. The champion from each region advanced to the finals for $50,000 in scholarship pricing, so uh, that could very easily get you out of college debt-free. Yeah, we're definitely in the rounds that are starting to really matter. These teams that we're going to see today are all 3-0, and zero, so one more win will secure them for those uh, regional playoffs. All right, the players will be playing Conquest with a twist. Uh, this twist will be a self-ban. So no longer you have to worry about your opponent banning out your favorite class. You can do it yourself. You play Priest, you're like, why did I bring this? You're just banning it. <laughs> and you see best of five, so pretty familiar if you've watched some of the Hearthstone Championship Tour action or even last season of Training Grounds. And self-ban definitely adds a different dimension to it. You know, Chucky, when we were watching the teams yesterday, did you see a major difference in you know how you approach these matchups with the self-ban? Yeah, I think the major difference we saw was just uh, that teams were more willing to bring some risky decks, some decks that don't have great matchups across the board, and if they run into those tough matchups, they can just self-ban it out. So we saw some more Freeze Mage, some more Paladin, kind of targeting specific classes, and when those strategies didn't pan out, we saw the self-ban come in. All right, well, let's go ahead and take a look at the schedule for today. We will start with Brown versus Montreal, then go to UMass versus UConn, and end the day with Case Western versus Miami University, and that is, uh, if you're keeping track, that's Miami and Ohio. I learned that that's actually a thing. Oh, I knew that. Oh, I didn't. I'm from Florida, so I was just naturally like, oh, great. <laughs> but what's it doing, you know, not in the South? But yeah. yeah. That's a schedule for today. All right, take a look at the East standings before we begin. So, yeah, as we saw yesterday, this is pretty much just highlighting who's doing the best right now, who's faring the best overall. So all those teams listed are at 3-0, Delaware, Rutgers, MIT, UMass, St. John's, New York University, Clarkson, and Princeton. To the right, you see the smattering of individual game scores, but obviously those aren't really the scores that matter. Yeah, match score really all we're looking at to qualify for those playoffs. So maybe get a little bit of tiebreak advantage based off the game score, but all of those teams are doing very well at 3-0, and zero, just need one more match win to advance to the playoffs. All right, well, we have our picks that we would like to see advance. We'd like to know who you at home have advancing, though. Hit us up on Facebook at facebook.com slash Team Tespa or on Twitter at, at Team Tespa. We'll be taking you know time during the broadcast to answer some questions. We had some great ones yesterday. Definitely thank you for <laughs> sending those in. Ended up in some haikus. but uh, Yeah. yeah. You want to ask about haikus, probably. Uh, let's leave that for yesterday. Yeah. Let's have a haiku-free broadcast. Give, give us some new, new stuff to do for you guys. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get to know the first two teams. We are looking at Brown University versus Université de Montreal, I think. Yeah, I think. Montreal. Montre yeah, Montreal. <laughs> All right, so Brown University bringing Rogue, Shaman, Hunter, and Warlock. Montreal bringing Hunter, Shaman, Paladin, and Mage. What do you think about these lineups? Well, looking at our notes, we actually, you know, looking at the classes, you think, okay, pretty standard. But looking at the notes, we see some really interesting stuff. Uh, last week, Brown University had Reno Rogue, Nazoth Hunter, and Agro Paladin, which they left Paladin at home this week. But, uh... For Montreal, they had C'Thun Warrior, Murloc, Paladin, Freeze Mage, in addition to the kind of standard mid shaman. So maybe we're going to see a lot of control matchups in play today. Great. Yeah. Starting the day off right, you know, we'll we'll hope to get, you know, some quick matchups in there, but maybe some of those longer, more technical matchups as well. All right. Let's get to know Brown University. We have QWERTY Elmer, Dark Calculus, and Moon One. You know, we were discussing the meta of the majors yesterday. Chalky, your, your number one pick right there. Yeah, mathematics major in a game about mathematics. Not a game about math. Hoping he doesn't miss lethal. We, we only saw one yesterday, but uh, I'm just saying those math majors help out in those situations. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I agree, and I, I see why you think it's a game about math, but, you know, bright colors, wonderful noises, friendship, 
hanging out with cool characters from the Warcraft universe, I would argue it's a liberal arts game. <laughs> okay, bro. All right, so let's get to know the other team, though, University de Montreal. That's JSM, Monsanto, and Pelletier. And I want to point out, uh, Monsanto was actually playing in the America's Spring Championship, so... Uh, like dude yesterday, he's one of these players who is not just doing it, you know, at college or local tournaments or even weekly cups. He's actually making it to, you know, the higher tiers of regional competition. Yep, has definitely shown his stuff before on the Hearthstone Championship Tour. So, going to be looking for good things out of him. Obviously, his team is 3-0 and zero right now, so should be some solid play coming out from these guys. Yeah, I like the uh, the picture we have from Monsanto. That is a that is a man of intensity. I, I think that was his face. Oh my goodness, they're dressed to the, they make us look like bums. Yeah. Isn't it isn't it great we dress up just so they can do this? You know, when you got to have a Hearthstone match, but got to dress up to go catch class right after. Yeah. No, look, they're actually just like, oh, time to time to get the bus or whatever it is college students do these days. I don't know if they drive there. But we're actually ready to get right into our first game of this series. Looking at the self-bans, Brown has banned out their rogue. Montreal has actually banned out their mage. Uh, why do you think Brown chose to ban out the rogue? Uh, maybe they're looking at Rogue as not having a great time against uh, Shaman, against Freeze Mage, potentially. The Freeze Mage was obviously self-banned by Montreal, but uh, potentially, you know, just thinking that might be one of their weaker decks here. Uh, I would generally think it would be the Rogue or the Warlock getting self-banned from them. All right, well, after the self-bans have come out, do you see either team as having a clear definitive advantage? Well, you can kind of see two classes are shared by both teams, so the real difference comes in with the Warlock and Paladin. Yeah. And, I mean, traditionally, you would think a lot of people would tell you Warlock's kind of stronger right now. We don't know if it's Zoo or Reno. They didn't actually play Warlock last week, so it's kind of a new thing for them. Uh, whereas for Montreal, we expect it to be Murloc Paladin. But uh, I think I would favor Brown on, on decks alone especially with given how well Hunter lines up into Paladin, it can kind of be a liability for Montreal. Yeah, interesting to me is that neither team bringing Druid. You know, when we, again, talk about kind of what are the, the two powerhouse classes right now, it's mostly Shaman and then Druid, but uh, both classes actually just, you know, calling Audible, not bringing that, just going mm -hmm. with the Hunter. So uh, obviously we talked a little bit about this, and I don't want to overanalyze it. There is the element of comfort pick, mm -hmm. but have you seen anything in, in any of the, you know, training ground stuff so far that would lead you to believe that Hunter is maybe a sneakier pick or... Um, we have seen quite a bit of Hunter. I mean, I think it's one of the top classes, maybe top four, top five. But yeah, Druid is kind of traditionally considered one of the best. Uh, I think I would go along with what you said. It's probably more along the lines of comfort picks, especially when you have three players. Uh, kind of everybody has their own deck that they really like. Right. And you can bring that into the fold. Maybe they have somebody that really likes to play Murloc Paladin, knows the ins and outs. And they're thinking, okay, well, we'll bring that for you. And then we'll bring along Standard Shaman, and then we'll bring around our classes. All right, while we're waiting for Montreal to get into the game, we're going to go ahead and take a question from Twitter. This is from KO. Rob, do you regret cosplay? Ooh, getting right into it. Ah, well, there comes a time in a man's life where he's sitting in a hotel room drinking uh, brew with you know, such great minds as Savitz, Rachel Querico, uh, Trevor Houston, and they think, Gosh, this Bob Ross thing is really big on Twitch, and it's mm -hmm. Halloween tomorrow. What if we just did this? And you're a very gullible sucker, this guy. And you go, gosh, I'd love to. And then you go buy a wig, and you have it in mind as basically like a 30-second segment where, like, Rachel's doing an interview, and you're in the background with the easel, and it's like a, you know, ha-ha, everyone spams Kappa Ross. And, okay. Yeah. And then... Uh, you that, know, that's you, expectation. Right. Now, and what's then, reality? Well, your friends are like, no, gosh, we got to do this for a whole series. And then you're like, no, 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 no. This can't happen for a whole series. This is going to be extremely So you're cringy. shifting the blame here. Uh, I'm actually fully shifting the blame. I want to point out, too, <laughs> I got him down to one game, and it was a life coach game. That's a long time yeah, to be cosplaying. It, all I remember is yeah. that, you know, it was really funny at first. Yep. And then it was just an actual really long life coach game of, a lot of happy little trees. Well, thankfully, Kranich uh, put him out of his misery sooner than Life Coach probably would have liked, so there were less ropes overall. But yeah, I don't actually regret it. It's kind of a fun memory now. I would definitely do it differently if I had a time machine. So. No regrets. Okay. Mm. Mm. Not even one? Mm. No. Let's go with no. Okay. It's a uh, life's an adventure. Guys, as I said earlier, we are waiting for uh, you know teams to get into their matches, having a little bit of a connection issue going into this. You know, when we were watching yesterday, I want to highlight that 
there were plays that were kind of not necessarily at the highest level that you might see. You know, we have the world championship actually starting up opening week tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But these are people who are coming in, and, and for a lot of them, this is kind of their first opportunity to play at the competitive level. So when you're watching this, you know, we'll obviously be talking about the plays and kind of like what we think they should be doing. And you probably shouldn't listen to anything I say. What Chucky's saying is more directed at what you could possibly do to be improving those lines of play as opposed to like what you should absolutely be doing. Yeah, it's definitely kind of a mixed bag with these teams. Um, we've seen Hearthstone Championship Tour competitors that have made it to the championships. We've got Monsanto coming up. We saw Dude uh, yesterday. But also you have players that, you know, maybe haven't been playing Hearthstone for the longest time. Uh, it's just a hobby of theirs. And they thought this would be pretty fun to do with some friends. So you're going to see, you know, a mix of very high level and very, you know, casual level Hearthstone in this tournament. Well said. And we're going to get into game number one here. And again, we see Montreal on the bottom there. <laughs> Rocking the suits. I love it. But it's going to be mid-range hunter. Yeah. Look, when you come to play Hearthstone, you just come to play Hearthstone. I actually think it's aggro hunter uh, based off the hunter's mark and the Argent Squire. It's probably just going to be the aggressive secrets build. All right. Do you think that changes anything in this matchup against I the do. Paladin? Uh, I think that's not a good thing for them. I think it's still an okay matchup. But when you're so all in against uh, Paladin, which has Forbidden Healing and Ivory Knight for a lot of healing... Uh, you'd almost rather have like Savannah High Main, Ragnaros, and Call of the Wild in the game where those things need to also be interacted with than just straight burn damage. Yeah, obviously Paladin can recover from that. It's kind of better to just build a board that, you know, you're constantly forcing the Paladin to guess, do they have to use the removal tools, you know, make them try to do multiple things at once. But if you do kind of go all in there initially, uh, it can be a bit rough. Plus, I feel like at least some of the secrets, you know, don't necessarily affect Paladin that much. Yeah, Paladin's actually one of the few classes that can kind of just ignore the secrets for a really long time. I mean, and then win off of sticking a Tyrion or sticking Ragnaros Lightlord, whose effect will just continuously heal them. You don't need to attack, don't need to play spells, don't really need to do anything to interact with these secrets. But uh, the big danger is going to be in this early game how much pressure the Hunter can apply. Doomsday are obviously not going to line up great in the Kindly Grandmother, so we'll have to see how Montreal deals with this. Yeah, so as you pointed out, the stickiness of Kindly Grandmother, uh, you know, and obviously the ability to generate a body that was bigger than the original, doesn't make Doomsayer a super appetizing play. But is it one of those things where you kind of figure later on, are you actually going to get value out of it? Yeah, I mean, you could just go for it Jeez. now. It would obviously increase the amount of damage on the board for Brown, but... The thing is, like you said, you're not really going to get a great opportunity to do it later. It leads into either Coin Barnes or Coin True Silver, and it also just denies development for the next turn. So you're not going to see Cloak Tuntress come down. Uh, the worst case scenario might be like an Eagle Horn Bow just getting equipped, so your opponent didn't really you miss a beat. That, but... Oh, wow. <laughs> Montreal getting a little feisty. Yeah. They brought the suits, and they're like, look, you didn't suit up. Shouldn't be here. But of course, you know. It's college. Who wears a suit in college? Did you? No. No. I Not a that. single time. Nope. I went to every class in like basketball shorts, Jordans. Yeah. Like a, it was yeah. all sweatpants and tees for me. Yep. Yeah. Montreal, uh, you know, try harding just a little bit, but well, I, I respect it. I wasn't showing up at 8 a.m. to impress Rob. Well, yeah, I got nothing for that. That's just, that's just statistically true. Every morning you woke up and you thought like, gosh, do I want to actually put on like a nice outfit? No. All right, well, the Doomsayer does resolve, which means Kindly Grandmother is uh, no longer so kindly. Just a 3-2 wolf. And Montreal is once again back on the initiative, and we'll see what they choose to do with it. The Loot Hoarder, you know, lines up pretty well with that 3-2. Don't mind it so much. Allows you to cycle towards more of your win conditions. You could equip the True Silver, but I don't necessarily know that you options, are, like, options. that worried about something on 4 the True Silver is going to deal with. Yeah, I mean, they do have a coin for into a four with Barnes and True Silver available. Yep. They could save the coin to maybe look to coin out Ivory Knight or later on, if they want to look really far ahead, coin out an eight drop. Um, I mean, I think looking at their options, sure. what's going to work out the best would just be coin True Silver proactively deal with this because the Loot Hoarder would run into Freezing Trap um, as interference. So if they just went ahead, took care of this right now, I think that would end up working out best for them. What about Barnsing out Tyrion? Barnsing out Tyrion. Yeah. You like that? Pretty good. All right. We do see the True Silver Champion come out. So to your point, Brown is now going to have to figure out how much they want to basically throw something into that buzzsaw. Yeah. 
I mean, especially when you see the Argent Squire, you sort of do know it's going to be the aggressive list. Uh, they don't run too many threats. True Silver kind of deals with them really cleanly. So what can Brown really piece together here that's going to be effective, especially given that Montreal knows oh, they have the healing yeah. options going into the late game? Come midnight. All right, so they are just choosing to go ahead, get the value from that Freezing Trap, play down the Secret Keeper, yep. Cloaked Huntress. Yeah, it already looks like Brown is pretty low on cards already. You know, Unleash the Hounds is basically a dead card. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you may occasionally see a situation where you get one Hound, but not going to be getting too much value off of that. Yeah. A lot of the cards in the aggressive hunter list, like Explosive Trap, Unleash the Hounds, mm -hmm. not going to be effective against control decks. Uh, it's kind of tailored to beat mid-range decks, tailored to beat other aggressive decks, but when it comes to control decks that have a lot of healing, like Warrior, Paladin, uh, even Priest, if they happen to run into that, it tends to be a pretty tough matchup where a lot of your cards are ineffective and going into the late game, your burn isn't mm. enough to get through their healing. Montreal, considering what they would have to do based on which secret they think this is. Uh, Snake Trap, we are starting to see more of. I know there's a really popular uh, aggressive version of this that did have Snake Trap, so maybe that was a consideration for them, but they're going to realize quickly that it is not. Yeah, I would say they're... Uh, choosing to play around Snipe quite a bit here by going with this instead of the Barnes. It also sets up the Doomsayer, which you know is kind of just going to eat up uh, either a lot of burn or it's just going to get ignored. Deal with that Secret Keeper, which you previously didn't have an answer to. So going to work out really well for them, set up for the Barnes the next turn instead. Yeah, they're sitting pretty. Uh, maybe the only consideration where they could be a little bit worried is, you know, the two any fins in hand now. They don't have a lot of cycle, but they got Tyrion, so they're looking into having a pretty uh, good series of next turns. They have the Ivory Knight. And that's a... Uh, I don't know that essentially is high roll in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, there were obviously a lot better of outcomes, but yeah. it's, it's certainly above average here. Um, but probably not going to be too relevant unless it comes, unless they start drawing some blue go warriors and other murlocs and can close out with any fin later. Well, Brown is just kind of at a point where it's you know, looking at what they have. This might just be the turn to unleash. Does yep. it really get better? No. Nope. Two minions on the board. Uh, but you do understand that you have the freezing trap up, so mm -hmm. do you necessarily want to bounce Barnes? Um, you, you're fine with that, I think. I mean, at worst... They it's play just going to come six, down again. Yeah. yeah, it takes their whole turn. You're much more concerned about other things. You're kind of just looking at how to sequence out the burn to win the game. Um, so you, got, you have to kind of think, do we want to get Catrick down? Do we think the Paladin is going to be playing a spell on turn six? I think the answer to that's probably no, but maybe they want to clear your board, so maybe they do. So I think Fiery Bat Unleash certainly kind of happens here, and the question is really, is Cat Trick going to push more than Hero Power? I mean, you are you are essentially just on the plan, though, where you need to Hero Power every single turn. Mm -hmm. Like, that's pretty much where your damage is coming from uh, over time. But then you, you do you know, know those Forbidden Healings are there, and it's less exciting than in most matchups where you know you put people on that clock. Yeah. And I am a little surprised to see them forego the Unleash, just save it for later. It's only going to get worse from here thanks to the Freezing Trap, and they let the Fire Bat die to board. Which Options. is kind of interesting, I think. Um, I would have liked to go for the Unleash over the Cat Trick. Yeah. yeah, there just aren't too many situations that I can really think of where you would... Well, until the end of the game when you die too. <laughs> anything can happen. Uh, obviously, at that point, you're looking at a full board, but, you know. Seven... Really powered up Murlocs tend to beat seven one one hounds. So, yeah, I think that was pretty much the window to get value out of Unleash the Hounds. Yep, and Montreal probably just going to go with the Ivory Knight oh, for free healing, considering if they should play it before trading in to try and soak that one damage on it. But they decide they don't really mind it hitting face. All right, let's see. What we get off the Ivory Knight, and gosh, I guess you just take Blessing of Kings. Yeah, none of those very great. Yeah. You kind of threaten a Consecration this way, so yep. like maybe your opponent plays around that a bit more, which is nice because they kind of just can't afford to at this point. All right, I, I think they're, it's pretty much high main or, well. Yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, looking at those options, does that do any of them really stand out to you as being like the clear pick? Eagle Hornbow? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, Kindly Grandmother is another body, but 
the odds of it surviving and actually doing anything super impactful feel pretty low. Yeah, about zero. What? Not zero. It dies on board. Well, you kill, obviously in that scenario you would kill command one of the things to try to help it. Sounds awful. It does sound You're awful. You're gonna kill command something to try and get your one one to push more than five damage. Uh, that's I'm why not. I said you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I would have taken the eagle horn bow all day. That's just more damage. Yeah. Yeah. It's just six. I mean, look. I don't play hunter, man. There's very few things I know to play. But Hunter's one of them. Okay. Yeah. So Montreal knows that. It's likely a cat trick, so it's kind of awkward if you forbidden healing this turn. Like, you get all the healing in, you heal the full basically, but you Should do give I? them the bow charge, you give them the 4 2 stealth cat. Um, but you are rolling into Tyrion. I mean, net gain, you still get eight extra life out of it. You give your opponent four attack from the minion, three attack from the bow. Um, but if you don't play it, I think you actually do risk dying, right? Well, on 15 health with the bow equipped. It'd be it would tough. have to be, it'd so have to it'd be, be like perfect. Yeah, it would have to be well, okay, so it'd have to basically involve two kill commands. It's six mana. We need a beast down. And you'd still have to hero power. So Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, I don't Uh even Huffer Kill Command Hero Power. So Huffer Kill Command Quick Shot would be okay. exactly yep. fifteen. Yeah, so let's say that's the exact sequencing or sequencing of cards, you might just feel safe and doesn't use the hero power, plays around Unleash the Hounds. Uh, there's no point to making the 1-1 mm -hmm. one, one knight, so. Yeah, and Snake Trap, obviously a very dead draw for Brown here. You probably just have to Unleash I mean, you getting three targets, put in the Snake Trap. If they if they use Consecration, you get the cat. Yeah, the, mm. the only thing is, like, it's a little unfortunate that they can't really set up lethal through Tyrion. Um. This will probably just prompt out the Forbidden Healing from Montreal. And I mean, this is reasonable. If they're just, if you happen to dodge Forbidden Healing, I mean, yeah, Tyrion would be a problem. But mm -hmm. if you can dodge just those two cards, basically, you win the game. So, yep. I don't mind it. They, they honestly got a little bit fortunate in how the hounds ended up working out because they did get a better unleash. So, yeah. Should I? I like that from uh, Brown. Hmm. I think you realize you're in a point where you're either going to win here or you're just going to lose through attrition. Yeah, I think for Montreal, the really big thing to talk about is, like, they chose not to play that Forbidden Healing last turn because, yeah, it gives your opponent seven more damage, but they're kind of just in a situation now where they have to do it anyway. Right. And they can't play Tyrion. So had they just gone, you know, bit the bullet, done the Forbidden Healing last turn, yeah, you're going to take seven on the back end, but then you get to play your Tyrion on curve. Sure. Now it looks like they're considering Pyromancer Forbidden Healing, which does get rid of all the threats on board, does heal you. Uh, you will, unfortunately, end up giving them the 4-2 cat, which you had mentioned, but ah, yeah. not the end of the world. Well, it looks like they're doing this because they kind of realize, okay, yeah, we get four less health, but we push 10 damage. Yeah. Hopefully we don't die this next turn. It's pretty unlikely. Uh, they'd need, you know, eight damage out of hand, which would have to be two perfect cards once again. And if they don't have it, then we're representing lethal damage on board. So works out really well for them. Yeah, so this uh, version of the deck, I believe it misses out on things like Infested Wolf. It doesn't have the Hound Master. I think that generally you see like one copy of. I'm not even sure it runs high main. I would imagine it does. You know, obviously old aggressive no, it doesn't. hunters. Oh, so it just doesn't run high main at no. all. No. Just tops out at Leroy Jenkins. Wow. Good old aggro hunter. Yeah, that uh you know I respect it. I respect it. But yeah, I mean it's not the strongest stack in the game, but it's uh you know, it does work in certain matchups. Yeah, this is also a change because last week, you know, Brown brought his off hunter. So obviously that one plays very differently. Mm -hmm. So kind of curious why you choose to make that change. Might be cool to see if at some point we can ask him. Uh, just purely curiosity. Well, Montreal does need to consider the secrets here. Could be Explosive Trap, which would block some damage. So they do have a guaranteed lethal, I think. Hmm. Um, yeah, they can just check the trap with the Pyromancer. See that it is not explosive, and that'll do it. All right, so that's going to wrap up game number one for Montreal. And 
Yeah, we mentioned at the beginning of this year. They have Monsanto, who is someone who made it to the America's Summer Championship. That's really big to have. Offers you, you know, a lot of confidence coming into these sorts of events, and you know, obviously just the overall game knowledge. So, they managed to pull out game one. See if they can uh, do it again in game two. Yeah, and I think uh, overall out of their decks, that was kind of class-wise one of the weaker ones. Yeah. So pretty big game win there. They're still going to have Shaman to win with. And uh, I believe, was it Warrior was their last one? Yep. I think uh, for... I think we have it pulled up here. Shaman, Mage. Nope, nope it was nope. Hunter this okay. week. Yep. Switch it up. Yeah, we saw they were all business even after their win. No smiles. You know, I I think they're really rocking out the suits no smile thing, and there's no there's no pre-victory pizza. These are not got to order after. No men of hubris here, but yeah, they have a uh, shaman and hunter remaining. Brown will still have to get it with shaman hunter and that warlock deck, which, as you said, like we're not entirely sure what that is. Mm -hmm. Seems quite likely it's probably discard zoo, as most other versions of zoo or most other versions of warlock rather kind of mm -hmm. fallen off the map a bit. Yeah, I haven't seen Reno in quite a while in competitive tournaments, but yeah. you never know. Could just be something that they prefer. Well, I'm pretty sure you single-handedly destroyed that deck in DreamHack Austin. Did I? Yeah, you saw it. You, you won it in that last match, and oh, yeah. you know, Reno couldn't come out on five. That was really so. good against my lineup. I just felt bad. But <laughs> like, with Zoo, it's pretty good. Yeah. Zoo versus Reno is nice. No, it's uh, it's cr honestly, I didn't expect Zoo with the abusive sergeant change to still be a deck that you know saw a lot of play in tournament, but you know it's still managing to get there. Malcazar's in yeah. has been a big game changer. Yeah, you see people kind of cut down to maybe one abusive. Uh, it is certainly it hurts. Sure. The big implication is now you can't just play abusive as a serviceable one drop on one. Right. Uh, it doesn't really challenge anything as a one one for one. Uh, so. Voodoo. Doctor. <laughs> When's Voodoo Doctor getting nerfed to a one one, Rob? Ah. Uh, you know, it's on our to-do list. It's, just, there's it's so many something things. we're looking at. We're keeping an eye on it. Yeah. You know, definitely monitoring the situation yeah. with uh, that oppressive card. But I've been told that the next match is actually going to be a Hunter Mirror. So, SM Orc. I'm very excited. These are the good matches. These are actually... I tend to find that you know people look at Hunter and they think, oh, this is a class that you know you just hit the button, deal two damage. Uh, there's a lot of actual skill involved in this mirror, I think, in terms of like what you do with your bow, how often you actually trade, when you kind of put your foot on the gas and just decide to go face. I just press the button. I mean, that's all you do? You don't play minions? No. Nah. Oh, wow. 15, 15 presses, they're dead. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's mathematically accurate. So Brown was bringing the more aggressive hunter. Uh, curious to see what Montreal is bringing with them. Based off Argent Horse Rider, it's probably also the aggressive version. See, I have actually seen lists quite recently that are a little bit slower that run one horse rider. So I'm not necessarily as sold. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sold. I feel like we've, in this span of like having roughly five hours casting together, we've already had a lot of bets. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm willing to make another. Okay. Slower. I'll make the bet. Shoot. <laughs> Just here, yeah. And, uh, that unfortunately. Yeah, you know, bad. I've seen some of those mid range lists that they. They slip in that one copy of Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> no, no. Stop it. Stop making fun of me. No, I, there's, I know there's no decks like that. I know what I beat. Okay. Yeah, good, so this is good. just going to be a good old fashioned slobber knocker right here, and it's just going <laughs> to. That's an admirableism. I see. A slobber knocker. Yeah. Could you, like, give me a definition, use that in a sentence? I think it's a verb. I slobber knocker. You slobber knocker. Usted is slobber knocker. So, okay. Yeah. I actually, uh, I'll take your word for it. I was going to say, I've never seen that word written down. But. I mean, I could spell it. Well, it seems like it'd be fairly easy to spell. Yeah, it, just slobber and then knocker. <laughs> Gosh. This is that high level analysis that we bill you for. This is why, yeah, you, exactly. this is why you get paid. But this match is going to probably go pretty quickly uh, once it actually gets out. We see here the potential for double Secret Keeper with the coin. And then if yeah. the Secret Keepers survive, you've got a secret in hand. Well, it feels bad from Brown's point of view because they're like, okay, you know, our Secret Keeper is probably just going to get eaten by their Secret Keeper. Right. And that's really bad, but there's a chance it doesn't. And then even if it does, we play down Snake Trap. Yep. Well, that doesn't actually work because it would buff their Secret Keeper, too. So, I don't know. It's, you know, the Secret Keepers into Secret Keeper. Generally, the Secret Keeper with the attack initiative is the best Secret Keeper. You said Secret Keeper a lot there. You know, I've 
you know, I'd like to think maybe at their college they have like a secret keeper theory class. <laughs> they, they go there and they're like, all right, you know. Yeah. Now, who's, in who's college, best? I had a lot of spare time, but probably not that much spare time. Said we're just going to see the tracking, and Brown's going to feel really good about that. Do you think they know the secret keeper interaction? I mean, I honestly forget about it all the time. Yeah, I just forgot about it while I was like talking. You know, I was like, well, they could just play the snake trap and run over. No, nope, that doesn't work. Nope. So they should probably trade in both of their secret keepers first before playing the secret. Let's see if they uh, they know it. We got Eaglehorn, though, off of the tracking. We'll see what Brown chooses to do here. We wait <laughs> in bated breath. I mean, generally in this matchup, you know, hey, it's two aggro hunters. You want to be hey, hitting each other. You know other, why they spotted this? Math major. Yeah. Look, like, guys, come on. He's like, come on. One plus one. This is what I specialize in. Adding together small numbers. Yeah. Yeah. That's Hearthstone. <laughs> you know, I feel like most people didn't see those commercials, so they don't appreciate the that's Hearthstone line. Eh, enough, all them. Solidifying once again the need for an actual hard story and Eagle Hornbow going to clean up one of the secret keepers here. Ah, oh, except now you got snakes. Yeah. Now Snake you got trap snakes. was really good here. I think Montreal went with the bow over the horse rider, thinking, okay, you know, this plays on freezing trap, yep. but they ran into exactly what they didn't want to see. Snake trap was really powerful for Brown and Yeah, why did it have to be snakes? Have to be snakes. I mean, the, the opening they went with was a bit risky. They went ahead and just coined out both Secret Keepers rather than maybe uh, waiting on them and trying to coin out Argent Horse Rider to deal with it. Right. And they got maximum rewarded. Yeah. I mean, this is one of those situations where, especially in the early going against Hunter, when you're you know playing the mirror, that secret early on is so punishing because if you don't play it around it correctly, and to be honest, there actually really wasn't a way for Montreal to like totally correctly program that secret because it was snake draft. Yeah. Now you you see that end up taking a really bad situation there. And I guess like thinking about it, coining out two secret keepers into the secret keeper wasn't wasn't really a risk. If um, you knew the interaction. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you know, they play their secret, it buffs all three, and they still can't run over anything. And then you just get into a situation where, you know, the player with more secret keepers is getting the best out of it. So this is why we need Secret Keeper Theory. 101. It's an yeah. introductory class. Yep. Yep. Your first week of school. It's like defense against the dark arts. Professor Chalky. <laughs> I could see it. I think you make a great college professor. We, I Maybe mean, we were, for Hearthstone classes. We were playing some games earlier. You were uh, you were setting me on the right path. There were times where I just wanted to gore how people in the face. We were like, no, no, no. We were tanking up. We were tanking up a lot. Oh, Those were some won. good games. We even won. Uh, yeah, we won. Control Warrior versus Murloc Paladin. It was a good time. It's hard to do. We just tanked up out of it. <laughs> I do remember the very uh, the very moment you were like, nope, we can officially survive two anything. <laughs> so in the meantime, Montreal, though, uh, continuing to have to address this board. Now, 18 health doesn't necessarily look that low in a standard game. It's but pretty low. It's pretty low in this matchup. Yeah, no healing, no real taunts in these decks. They're both essentially the same deck. And, you know, when you get that lead, if you don't immediately respond to it, it's basically a signal now for Brown. Okay, there was no Unleash the Hounds. Yep. We should be pretty golden to just race and win from here. Now, was is there any universe where you would have just jammed Cloak Huntress immediately and then ripped the secret just to, like, pretend it's Freezing Trap? Yeah. Yeah. That's Every good, time. Just mind game them. I mean, it's just a pretty... If you do it fast enough. APM techniques? Yep. It's a, it's a pretty good play this turn is the oh, thing. Man. Like, it's just... You know, makes the most efficient usage out of their mana thanks to the Cloak Tuntress effect. You're playing six yeah, mana for four. But um, here's my thing. At the rate they did it, it's not like you look at that and you're like, maybe it's not Freezing Trap. Whereas if they'd done it immediately and just hit face, like you're like, oh, it's definitely Freezing Trap. It's definitely something I think comes into play a lot on ladder. Uh, in tournaments, I mean, when, when you're kind of thinking and you think every turn, yeah, you can try and go for like the bluff where it's like, okay, play this real confidently and they'll believe it. But uh, pretty good tracking here. Yeah. Unfortunately, the life difference for Montreal here at 14 is, I would say, pretty insurmountable. But basically, the choice is being unleash or explosive trap. Yeah. 
Now that, uh, mm. both of those options would have been a lot better probably like two turns ago. But at this point, you'll grab one. I would think you can't really make this a race. No. No, so you probably just have to take the explosive trap. Yeah, I like explosive because it plays around cat trick really well as well. Yep. Of course, if it is cat trick, I mean, the, at that point, the bow charges kind of just get you. I have to see how they trade here. It's kind of going to play out their hand face up when they, if they make an attack into a Cloak Huntress. I almost don't like them playing the Cloak Huntress here because, you know, knowing that it's Explosive Trap. Right, you trade into. They're just going to trade Huntress. in. Yeah. Well, so obviously the Argent Horse Rider would survive the Explosive Trap, so the Cloaked Huntress. So when you're you're thinking of like what actually makes you lose, mm -hmm. you obviously consider explosive trap, and then from there, mm -hmm. uh, to your point now, you can kind of do some trades to get some value out of the minions uh, before you know. Well, rather as opposed to just running them into the explosive trap. Well, I see a pretty easy play here. Um, you can just trade in your four guys into the cloak tundras, go face with your own cloak tundras, find out it's explosive, play Argent Horse Rider, Hero Power Bow. Take Montreal down to five. You have an explosive trap up. You're at 29. Like <laughs> That's pretty good. You're going to win. Yeah. Yep. 100% agree. But we'll see what uh, Brown chooses to do here. Guess they uh, kind of got the worst end of the mind game there, maybe. But they can make the same play. It just leaves up the 3-4. Maybe they were thinking, OK, it could just be lethal this turn if it's not explosive. And even when you kind of lose out here by not killing the Cloaked Huntress, you're still so far ahead that it yeah. most likely won't matter. Well, let's see what Montreal has. That is an explosive trap up, so. They do have damage in hand. They have the Leroy, they have the Horse Rider, but yeah, I don't, I don't think they have enough time to put it together. Mm -hmm. Definitely gonna play this cat trick for free. Probably have to make a trade into the Cloak Tundras. I mean, it's just not going to work out in the end. Yeah. They're going to figure that out once they kind of sequence things out here, realize they're dead to board. Um, they would need to trade into literally everything, not proc the explosive, and pass, in which case you're just losing to the inevitability of the hero power. Quickly. Yep, so to your point, we see the trades coming out, and yeah. I mean, they do make sure to protect the Divine Shield from the Argent Horse Rider, but yeah, the, the health total you brought up is just 100% insurmountable at this point. Well, they're going with the uh, second explosive bluff. Even if this works out, you know, no way to deal 20 from them, so. Well, I mean, you watch Brown play around a trap, and they didn't really play around it in a way that was you know, optimal. Mm -hmm. So you might think it's one of those things where, I don't know, somehow they lose the game themselves, <laughs> which is kind of what you have to do from this point. So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a clever play here, bluffing Catrick as explosive, because generally, like, uh, in practice, this is actually something that happened in a Hunter versus Zoo match, where basically the Zoo wasn't going face because there was a trap up, and there's no way they're going to figure out it's Cat and not explosive because they're not just going to, like, soul fire your face. Right. So... They just go the rest of the game thinking, oh, that's just explosive. And they wait until they draw like Defender Vargas to proc it. But unfortunately in this match, it's not going to infinitely stall thanks to the hero power. I mean, you, you can kind of see the bluff worked if they make the trade into the horse rider. <laughs> yep. Got him. Yeah, I mean, you know, Montreal's still in a really <laughs> bad spot, but they're... <laughs> You can They're see him kind of laughing. Well, and, you know, realistically, not to oversell what's kind of taking place in this game. Like, yeah, Brown's, looks like Brown's probably going to win it. Uh, well, and definitely going to win it now. But yeah, this was more the result of the, the opening. Like, the opening is just very critical in this, and Brown definitely had the, the better opening that time around. Yep. The two secret keepers triumphed over the one. Uh, Montreal came up with a cute play at the end there. Wasn't close enough that it mattered, but you can kind of see how if it was close enough, nice. that could have been the deciding factor. Nice. Going out with style. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you're on this stage, 
and you have the opportunity to kind of like show people what you're about and you know get up there and have your proverbial 15 minutes of fame it's cool to kind of show off some of that stuff and you know we talked about it Masanto's coming from a pretty good pedigree at this point in, in competitive hearthstone career that you know you want to show off like hey you know these are kind of the cool tricks i can do yeah so i like it a cat trick if you will you're bad and you should feel bad i know yeah no that uh that was quite definitely though a cat trick and uh, series is now tied up one one. I just but but literally the I can't, secret was cat trick. Can't make eye contact. You know? I'm, just I'm look, sorry. Just look at the camera. Yeah, cast like this the whole time. Yeah. Yep. But uh, yeah, so one one series now. I like what we saw in Montreal. You know, even in the loss. And I gotta feel like at this point, watching these two teams, I definitely feel like they're the stronger group at this point, just from what I've seen in terms of how they make the plays. Brown has stumbled a little bit. I feel like in in kind of the judgment calls they've made and how they've played around secrets and. You know, that's one of those things where you know, it does separate the, the people who are good from the people who are very good. Yep. You really have to kind of get used to playing against this new Secret Hunter deck. It's something yeah. that hasn't really ever existed in Hearthstone, where usually Hunter decks have just played, like, one secret. They're like, okay, I'll put in Freezing Trap. Or in the case of Aggro Hunter, I'll put in Explosive. You kind of know what to expect, how to play around it. The only real deck where you kind of had to think about secrets was Secret Paladin. Yeah. And even then, it was kind of like, you know, you knew the general outcome of all the secrets. So, But now there's sort of this really weird game where it's like, okay, that could be Snipe, Snake, Explosive, Cat. Right, and all the secrets do very freezing. different things. Yeah, and yeah. it's just, it's kind of a mess of how you play around each one and, you know, what what's going to work out best for you in the end. But Brown had big enough of a lead that they could have afforded to kind of just... Play it really safe, you know, not walk into any traps. And Montreal kind of having a, a laugh about it. Sure. So game three is going to be the Shaman Mirror. I believe both of these groups are bringing mid-range Shaman. So this is kind of the more popular version of the deck we are seeing right now. Yeah. Very popular. Very. All over the place. Literally every match. Well, not every match. I want to point out we only ran into, like, one Shaman earlier when we did, like, six well, or yeah. seven ranked play games. I just meant in this tournament. Yeah, that's fair. Of course, when people are trying to, you know, win $50,000 in scholarships, they tend to play what's going to win. I mean, I brought up yesterday, I, you know what's fun? Winning. Winning's pretty fun. Yeah. You know what's not fun? Spirit Claws? Spirit Claws. Spirit Claws. Oof. Spirit Claws is not fun. Not at all. No. 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 You know, when I saw that card, I was like, oh, cool. And that looks fine. Like, I'm not, I'm not worried about this. <laughs> You know, people were telling me on Twitter, they're like, Rob, Spirit Claw's no good. You've got to worry about that one. I'm like, great. Thank you so much, Twitter hey, Hearthstone community. You know, back then, there was a much simpler time. Doomhammer, five mana, 16 damage. A weapon we could all get behind, Rob. Uh, that was the evil I worried about versus the evil I didn't know. That's true. You've been uh, you've been behind Doomhammer since 2014 in a big way. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I do remember a conversation at the Hammerstein Ballroom. You know what's great? Doing 16 damage. Nobody even believed me at the time. Nope. You were right. They were all just on that one Doomhammer plan. Ridiculous. Wasteful. Two years down the line, basically got it directly nerfed. <laughs> well, we've already established you are the one who gets the aggressive decks nerfed. So uh, seeing both of these teams starting out with the same thing, Spear Claws, Rolling Taunt Totems. A true mirror match. Yeah. Uh, Montreal's taking it a step further by becoming Thrall. I think uh, Brown's going to become Morgul now. I mean, I would hope. And Morgul is definitely the better. I, I know you like your Morgul. I do enjoy this Morgul. I think uh, Montreal might have been having a little bit of a connection issue, uh, which is why we saw that there. But they are in the game and you know, nah, nothing I, else to do this turn. I bet they're really thinking about this attack. <laughs> no, Rope comes out like, oh, we've thought about this too long. Well, it's certainly an awkward situation for Brown here. I mean, throwing out Feral Spirits would just present something that you know just dies if Montreal plays Spell Power. Um, something we saw in the Washington Mirror match last night was kind of a dude in the dudes. They, they threw out their Flame Tongue really aggressively just behind a Taunt Totem. Right. And they almost expected it to die, and then when it didn't, they kind of had like a little celebration party. Yeah. And that really was the catalyst into them crushing the Shaman Mirror match. I was almost wondering if that was just something that we could have seen Brown do here. Knowing it's protected by Taunt Totem, uh, you clear up your opponent's totem, 
and you kind of just start the totem warfare early. Uh, they're going to opt into the Feral Spirits instead, and we'll have to see how well that works out in comparison. I feel like Feral Spirits in this matchup is quite possibly one of the most interesting tools in terms of how you leverage it, because, you know, a lot of matchups, you don't have to worry as much about the swing of something like the Spell Power Spirit Claws or Lightning Storm necessarily. So you can just play it out as minions with taunt, and it's not a big deal. It builds board pressure. You can do cute stuff with Flame Tongue Totem later, but especially in this match, putting them out early, you know, for the investment you have to... Uh, basically invest into them. Mm -hmm. If it does get punished really hard, you can be on the back foot for quite some time. Yeah, it costs a lot of mana for what you really get out of it. Like, two two threes for net five mana is not great, but it can get you ahead on the board early, and if you can kind of snowball that into the advantage you need, then it can work out really well. Well, they are looking at a board they can deal with pretty handily from what they can see. Only on two mana this turn. Uh, might just be the sort of turn where you, you just make a totem. Yeah. Yep, put the Feral Spirit into the totem. Spirit Claw, the Blood Mage. Mm. I love those noises. It's so good. <laughs> now, obviously, I don't have any insight into this process despite working at Blizzard, but I like to think there was probably a time where Morgul was actually going to say, like, words. Just, you know, common tongue stuff. But no. Someone, some brave, beautiful human being was like, no. Murlocs Mur 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 can't yeah. speak common. Finley. Oh. Go. Yep, Finley got I lose. Him. Yep. Well done. Lore question. I got this, man. That's what I do. Yeah, I sit what, what's up with Finley? How can he speak? Well, I think Finley was raised by people, is my understanding. And I think he's also got kind of like... Yeah, but like... An edge British accent. They're animals, man. But, I mean, they're humanoids. You human. can't just teach an animal English. They're humanoids. Humanoids you can. They're sentient creatures. You ever played D&D, Chucky? I have. Okay. Well, some creatures... I accidentally are... killed my whole party. Yeah. Why would you yeah. do that? that? They never played with me again. <laughs> Don't get many invites after that. So Brown manages to clear Montreal completely off the board. Goes in and puts down the Flame Tongue Totem. And I brought this up, but I'm kind of leery of playing this much into Lightning Storm. I wonder... I don't know. Maybe it's not a big deal. Um, I mean, they do have a five drop to follow it up. So maybe they're thinking, okay, you know, first of all... We have two three health things, so if they don't high roll on both, they would at least have to use the spirit claws to clean up. Right. And you have seen the, you know, at that point, you actually have seen Blood Mage already. Mm -hmm. And even though they're sitting on the coin, you know they can't just Blood Mage Lightning Storm now. Now, if they're playing two Cobalt Geomancers, they it, could do that. I mean, who does that besides, you know, the young savage? William Barton. William Bar William Amnesiac Barton. Yeah. All right, so. Just going to go ahead and coin out the Drake, get some more draws going. Won't be overloaded on turn five, so could play down Thunder Blood Valley if they wanted to. Obviously, no totems on the board. Could even just go for thing from below. Yeah, they're going to take quite a bit more extra damage this way rather than going with the Storm immediately. But they're thinking that holding back the Storm is going to kind of help them win in this grindy mid-game battle. Because now that Shaman isn't playing really too many burn spells, you don't have to worry about going super low against them. Yeah, it's pretty much his lightning bolt at this point. Yeah, and Brown went for the spell power roll here. I believe that's, you know, obviously what they were looking to get. Missed out on it, so now kind of becomes an awkward answer where do you really just hex the Azure Drake, maybe? Well, because this deck is heavier these days and you have the bigger threats, it's one of those things where... I think if you go the hex route, your clock on when you feel you have to win this kind of accelerates. It does. Yeah, because you don't want to you don't want to stick around for the Thunder Bluff Valiant portion of the show or when Ragnaros eventually drops down. Yeah, I just feel like I mean, yes, they do have to have a pretty fast game plan. They're behind on cards, but they're ahead on life, so they're obviously the aggressor right now. Uh, but. Maybe you kind of get a read from last turn Montreal not dealing with your flame tongue. You think, okay, they can't kill it. Maybe they just don't have Storm. Maybe we just push on, go really quick, sure. try and end this fast. Yeah, now you could be looking again at the Lightning Storm play. You only have to roll high mm -hmm. on one of those targets now, but then it blocks you out from playing the Fire Elemental on six, which feels pretty bad here. Yeah, you could always play, um, if you if you go Totem into Lightning Storm, you could always play the thing from below next turn. Uh, another consideration would be if you just want to get the Tunnel Trog down for the 3-3 three, three stat line. What to do? Yeah, 
a lot of different ways this turn could go. And if they're all spell power, could always just Maelstrom Portal instead. Actually been fun stat. Zero Wrath of Air Totems in this match so far. Ooh, yeah. that is a fun stat. I know you were a, what is it, a st statistician? Sure. Statistician, whatever that is. Statistician? Statistician? Yeah. Wouldn't that be like the study of like statuses? <laughs> a little different. Can't fool me, Chucky. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I know things. That thing. Yeah, that. The thing with the numbers. I hate numbers. You're casting Hearthstone, Rob. Do you I know what's on the screen in front of us right now? Uh, I it's see just a lot of numbers. I see a Murloc hiding behind a totem. I see a Tunnel Trog. I see a Cleric, obviously trying to help her party. And I see another totem with fire behind it. There's a lot of numbers on the screen. I don't, I don't actually see those. Yep. Is that? OK, that explains a lot. I mean, you were playing with me earlier. I mean, you saw some of the choices I wanted to that make. That explains a lot. You were like, Rob, swinging Gorehal here means we lose four health. And I'm like, but think of the glory. Yeah, we almost lost because of that. Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you let me make my own plan. That's what happens. Well, for Brown here, you know, Montreal's play last turn was pretty interesting. And they did get a nice roll off of the Maelstrom portal, but... It put them in a spot where the Flame Tongue's not really doing anything, and they have the Fire Elemental on curve. They didn't overload, and they saved the storm. So, again, they chose to take just a tiny bit more extra damage. Oh, wow. Ooh, wow. Yeah, they're uh -oh. going to... Uh-oh. Yeah. They gave up a card draw. <laughs> Montreal just... <laughs> we see the, the realization from Brown. And Brown's like, no! <laughs> wow. Well. Math major won't make all the plays correct for you. I mean, look, there was no math there to to math. You know, you yeah, that was just that was an abstract yeah, kind of thing. That's where your boy uh, liberal arts comes in. <laughs> yep, yep. You need to have all the majors covered in your group. Yeah, it's important to have a balance there. Montreal was very excited though to get that card. But I think at this point, it's it's sort of turning into Montreal's favor. I mean, you could have kind of seen this coming, looking at that they had the more mid-game hand, and they've really allocated their resources in a way where they still have the storm, they still have, you know, they drew into another Maelstrom portal, which is going to be nice. They've got taunts to hide behind. They have a hex for a big threat. They basically have all the things they need. Yep. And if you look at Brown's hand, on the other hand, they just do not have the tools to close out. You know, they've got Spirit Claws for damage. That's not even guaranteed to hit face past taunt. Uh, gone are the days of just double lava bursting your opponent out of the game. Right. Yeah, no, and this is, to your point earlier, there's just so much less in the way of overall burst with those tools. So, you know, Brown probably going to have to win this one fairly honestly and try to find a way to build back on the board. Ragnaros is a good pickup. You know, at this point, there's only two minions on the board, so you're not looking at that sprawling totem metropolis that usually represents problems for Ragnaros. But even then, you haven't seen a single hex from Montreal, so not yeah. really looking at Ragnaros as a thing that's going to save you in this game. Yeah. It's going to be a long road out here for Brown, especially given that no matter what they play, it's just going to die on board. Their healing totem is literally feeding cards to Montreal right now, yeah, thanks yeah. to Northshire Cleric. It is not looking good. Yeah, I did want to point out, if you were wondering why the Northshire Cleric went into the healing totem, a uh, little... Man, those Wrath of Air totems, they are hiding. No, oh, you, you know, they get a lot of bad publicity. Nobody really likes them. You know... It's important to be liked. Wrath of Air Totem feeling a little bit of social pressure right now. Yeah. Stay home. Hiding away. Yeah. Got that. Uh, well, no more cards to the North Shark Cleric. And they also just decided to chip in one damage. Yeah. It's Seems good. good. Yeah, sure. That's less health. <laughs> yep. Overall. I yeah. mean, for Brown, they do have, like, you know, a slim way back into this game of Rag going face, picking up some lightning bolts, sure. just finishing the game off, dealing 15 damage from here. But it's, uh, it's a while away from fruition. So we see there a little bit of chatter going on for Brown. Looks like there's a little bit of argument over the plays, maybe. Maybe some in that group aren't as happy with the direction the game has taken. I actually do wonder about that because I've never played in this format. You know, if you the game starts going south and your opinions weren't being listened to, you know, is there just a point where you're like, no, I'm the captain of this ship now. You pull rank, insurrection abounds. 
I don't know. Yeah. It's the nice thing about playing alone in my pajamas. <laughs> Nobody argues with me. All right, so Montreal just building a pretty big board here. They've protected the Manatee Totem. will continue to draw cards, and everything's uh, coming up Montreal right now. Yep, Rag's going to have to uh, go up for the slam dunk here. The alley-oop. Who, who's the alley-ooping to? Well, I guess himself in this scenario. I mean, that's what he does. He, like, jumps up. You see in the animation. No, I, I screwed up. I'm sorry. I think not... Rag actually just goes for the three-pointer, though. Like, in reality, it's not a slam dunk unless there's that's no true. one he on board. Shoot. He if does If there's shoot. no one on board, like, no defenders. Just lay it yeah, in. Yeah, he just goes for the, the slam dunk. But Well, he's going to need to do a 360 windmill slam if he's going to pull them back into the game. Oh, you know, from half court here. I mean, literally about behind 20, half court. About a 25% chance, you know, this one. Let's see what we get. Ooh. He got there. Yeah. I mean, in theory, now Lightning Bolt into Azure Drake into Lightning Bolt. That's why he's one of the highest mana costed cards in the league. <laughs> Went uh, third in the Hearthstone draft. Yeah. You know, in 2014. You know, everyone was looking at Ysera as the number one pick. Rag just <laughs> jumps out of nowhere. Still used to this day. Yeah. I mean, a lot of cards can't brag about that. Karen's kind of had a Karen had an off season yeah. last, last season. 2015, you know, his game wasn't up to up to par. He was riding the pine. <laughs> now he's back. <laughs> well, for Montreal, I mean, that definitely puts a little fear in them. But Ooh, and that's going to be the season for Rag. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the injured reserve. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Hate to see that. Yeah, you turned know, just, into a frog. Let's watch the replay again. You can see right here as he goes up for the dunk, turned into a frog. That's a good season. Common way to end the season. <laughs> Eight points of damage and you're out. All right. Going to need a couple of lightning bolts for Brown here. Lightning Storm, also a good draw. Well, they definitely don't have much time at all. Oh, there's a lightning bolt for Montreal. Wrong side. Yeah. Well. It's three damage. Yeah, Brown's smiling. They're like, yo, Rag tried. We put him out there, Rag. Rag did what we pay the man to do. What can you say? Yeah. Leave well, it out in the court. It could Azure Drake try and hit up a lightning storm. Um, can't really see much alternative. They're not technically dead to board. Sure. There's, um, what, 12, 15, 16? Yes. Yeah, but you're looking at unactivated spirit claws, potential yeah, for yeah. lightning bolt. Like, like they don't have as much burst, but they get there. Well, it, it's kind of a, a debate of whether you think Drake in the storm plus some high rolls is a higher odds of winning the game than fire early face and next turn try to draw bolt. Right. And neither of those plans are going to work out in the end. Montreal going to easily be able to lethal them. They had to sweat it because of Ragnaros, but they got there. No, Rag definitely uh, made it interesting. So Montreal should very quickly spot this. They have like three different ways. No, two different ways to do this. Uh, three. Yeah. They have three. Yep. Under bluff. They also Lighting have the BM bolt. way, which is just roll a totem, hit spell power. Well, Montreal up to this point, uh, yeah, a lot of manners. They're very well dressed. I don't expect them to stoop to the kind of tactics we would use in ranked. Play. All right. Montreal goes up 2-1, so yeah, I said it earlier, I like some of the plays I've been seeing from them, even in losing situations. They do seem like they are, you know, able to put forth these kind of circumstances where they're at least playing in a way that leads to a win, so. Brown, gonna need to right the ship here a little bit. I wonder if they'll have some time to kind of talk in between the matches, because like I said, there was some discussion, I felt like, after some of the plays. And when you are playing with a team, you know, everyone kind of needs to have their, their ability to be heard. Well. No more Shaman Mirrors to be played since this conquest, so they're going to have to focus on beating the Hunter of Montreal. So maybe just move past that game, try and yeah. shape up for next game. Yeah, want to see what they do. Montreal just needs to get the win. With that Hunter deck, Brown will still have access to Shaman and Warlock. Still very curious as to what this Warlock is. Like I said, expecting Discard Zoo, but mm -hmm. always the off chance it's something different. And even Discard Zoo kind of has a lot of different uh, respective tech cards in it nowadays, so... But I'm willing to bet the Hunter's aggro hunter. That seems like a safe bet. What, why would you say that? Hmm. No reason. Yeah. You want to make the bet? I mean... Rob's known for making very, very unwise bets. I was going to say, I, on one hand, I want to because I like making stupid bets. But on the other hand, I've already seen the deck, so I'm not going <laughs> to. That's true. 
And uh, looks like they're going with that first. Should be, you know, at least a decent matchup for them. Kind of close to the 50-50 line. Maybe yeah. a little in the Hunter's favor with two copies of Explosive Trap and Unleash the Hounds. Yeah, those cards are definitely going to see a lot more value than they did against the, you know, in the Paladin match where it was Aggro Hunter versus Paladin. But, you know, I want to speak to that really quickly when we talk about favored versus unfavored matchups or percentages. Because, you know, a lot of times as a caster, you know through playing or you, you know through watching streams that certain matchups are tend to go in the way of one deck more mm -hmm. than the other. But, you know, it's not necessarily something where we toss out the percentages and they're extremely scientific. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you actually do track a lot of your matches. So, in your experience, you feel confident saying that this is usually just kind of a 50-50? Well, there's definitely some key cards for both sides. And, I mean, obviously, as a Shaman, when you have Coin, Totem, Golem, that's something you're going to want. Yep. Um, so, that's already just a good sign for Brown. They kept Harrison off the Mulligan as well, which I don't think is insanely great. But given that they're on the coin, they're going to have multiple options uh, thanks to the extra card. They're thinking, okay, you know, we'll have a insurance against Eaglehorn Bow, which is generally a pretty strong card for the aggro hunter. They usually get a lot of charges out of it, but not sure if that's going to be enough. Thing from Below is another one of the cards that works out really well in this matchup. Uh, just generally soaks up five points of help damage every time. There's no, like, deadly shot or anything in this list. No way to bypass taunts now that Iron Beak Owl has been nerfed. I was going to say, Iron Beak Owl is still out there. If you want to pay three men and you want to silence no, something. No, literally no one wants to do that. It's been proven. <laughs> <laughs> Just go out there on the streets like, ma'am, are you interested in silencing? No, I saw Iron Beak Owl the other day out on the streets. Yeah, he's homeless now. Nobody wants him. All right, so... Brown looking pretty good. They did get, to your point, the coin totem golem. And I want to point out there's been a little shift in who's driving. Uh, Cordy Elmer is now actually, you know, the shot caller. Maybe he's, he's the, you know, taking over. I mean, I want to point out that since Cordy Elmer took over, zero losses for Brown. <laughs> also, totem golem on curve every game. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, these are stats you can respect. He's a legend. <laughs> yeah. We, speaking of stats, I don't think in the entire last game we actually saw a Wrath of Air totem. No. None. Yeah, take that to the bank. No Wrath of Air Totems here. Yep. Nobody has their motivational posters. <laughs> All right, so the Totem Golem going to finally go down, fortunately. Maybe they both had motivational posters, but it was like, today your opponent's not going to roll Wrath of Air. I mean, that doesn't feel very proactive. I don't like that. Eh. I want to be rolling Wrath of Air Totems. I don't want my opponent not to. Like, what if you come up against someone who's not Shaman? Why do you really hang up that poster? And Paladin's going to roll it? No. But then the poster's right. I mean, that is technically, yeah. Okay, I'll give you that. Then think about it like that. Nice. Yeah. You're, you're right more often than you're wrong with that. Especially with the amount of Shamans. Mm, there are a lot of Shamans. There's a lot of Shamans. A lot of Shamans. All right, so looking at tracking, we'll see what Montreal gets. No, or I was lying. Not. We're not. Jeez, Rob, you do this lying thing way too often. It's a hard life. <laughs> well, after the tracking. We can simulate what cards might have been there. Okay. Yeah, what so do you think they get off this? I say high main. They're I not say, running high main. So I Leroy. say unleash. Unleash? Yeah. All right. Uh, you say unleash. My serious pick is Cloaked Huntress. Oh, come on. <laughs> All right. All right. Scam Oz. Am I right? <laughs> All right, so we're going to fill out the rest of the turn. Arjun Horse Rider coming down would allow them to pretty handily deal with the healing totem. And because of how board-centric this matchup is, even though you are playing the aggressive deck, you don't generally want to leave the totems up because of you know, things like, well, not things like, things that are mm -hmm. Flame Tongue Totem. Something like a Flame Tongue <laughs> Totem. Gosh. No, just... but the other, the other consideration is kind of that given that you run Explosive Trap and Unleash the Hounds, you care a lot less about zero two sticking around than other classes do. Well, the thing I was thinking of is if you put down the Flame Tongue Totem, you could get rid of the first body of the Kindly Grandmother. And I know yeah. generally the consensus is that you, you don't want to do that. But if you can and you keep something on the board, it heals up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I guess the 3-2 at that point goes into the Flame Tongue, so maybe it is just strictly bad. But uh, certainly worthy of consideration. I do like the Cloaked Huntress with the Explosive Trap again. We've talked about the fact that these traps have so many different implications in what they do. That you can't just look at it anymore. You used to be able to in Hunter decks. You know, you'd be like, 
that is decidedly an explosive trap. Mm -hmm. But there's so many now to where you, you can't be that confident. Yeah, really not much of a read here. In fact, I think the most likely would be just cat trick. Like, it's a, it's a trap that your opponent played on a pretty neutral board. They're ahead. You know, you don't have an attacking unit, so it's not like... Unit? What is this, StarCraft? Don't have any Protoss on your board? Hey, okay. chose to go ahead and pop it. Gonna do the Robert Wing approved play. Well, now they have to win. And Healing Totem, gonna come right back from the grave. Yeah, so... Was there another totem they wanted more? Would you just think you want the Taunt Totem? Taunt would be really nice. Um, it's interesting, they rolled the totem after attacking. Right. So that says that generally when you do that, you're just saying, okay, I want anything but that 1-1. One, one. Yeah. Like 1-1 one, one is miserable. That's the general consensus when you roll after getting rid of your totem. If they rolled first, they would have had slightly higher odds of spell power or taunt, and they would have higher odds of both of them individually. Right. But... Well, things still looking pretty good for Montreal here. They're pushing damage. They get the Horse Rider down, threat in a hero power, which uh, is pretty important in this matchup. Well, this is sort of a swing turn, though, for Brown. They have Harrison Jones. They could even proc the trap yep. to try and get an extra card off of it. That looks like that's exactly what they're going to do. Yeah, this usually telegraphs to Harrison Jones. Isn't it? Yep, and they do have Thing From Below to fall behind on um, later to soak some damage, but they're taking quite a bit still. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, are you are you looking to save Knife Juggler for something like Unleash the Hounds, or are you just thinking, we're going now, we're pushing damage? I think it's kind of a we're going now situation. Um, you're, you're already going to be kind of happy if you get a good Unleash. Sure. You're really just trying to push damage. You're taking the Shaman down to 13. Explosive Trap takes them to 11. You can kind of look at Kill Command as taking them to 6. So you're really just kind of looking to fit in that last 6 damage. One more hero power makes that 4. So the critical number is kind of pushing 4 extra damage and drawing a beast or pushing 6 extra damage without a beast. Uh, mm -hmm. And you kind of just want to do that in whatever way possible. So I would just throw down the Knife Juggler, I think. Yeah, it's... Obviously, the Shaman doesn't have healing, so it's mm -hmm. not like you're worried about that. Those hero powers are sticking, but... Yeah. Uh, I mentioned this yesterday. There is kind of a point in this matchup where the Shaman can stabilize, and you're kind of relying on, you know, drawing your kill commands, your quick shots. Yeah. You know, getting through taunts like Feral Spirits thing from below. So, uh, looks like they are thinking, yep, they're just going to save it, though. Which is fine. Honestly, there is there is sensible direction to that. You know, you're, you're hoping to get the value off the knives. And it plays around something like Lightning Storm coming out. Yeah, that's the main consideration here. Montreal just feels like the odds of a Maelstrom portal with spell power or a Lightning Storm is just too high. Yep. They don't want to play more into it. They'd rather save it for an Unleash and think that, you know, okay, we've got time. Yeah. Yeah, you know, 13 health against a, a Hunter deck that is, well, any Hunter deck really, but a Hunter deck that's specifically built to be aggressive. Uh, really don't feel comfortable at all at that number. Yeah, it's just going to take Brown so long to push out the 26 damage they need to do to win in time. Ragnaros goes a long way towards helping that, and the thing from below is going to help them stabilize, but at the end of the day, they're just not pushing damage for these next few turns. Yeah, and that's uh, that's probably the biggest change with the way Shaman is built now. You know, like Shaman still has the potential to do a lot of damage, obviously, but, you know, it takes time to get there. They have to build out the board. Yeah, it's centered a lot more around card advantage, big beefy minions, and kind spirit of just claws. never running out of stuff. And Spirit Claws. And Spirit Claws. Spirit Claws is no Doom Hammer, though, when it comes to racing. It's true. I'm going to turn uh, winding down pretty quickly here. Yep. They just go ahead and deal with the trap this turn. They did not get the Spirit Claws down, though. Oh, look at that. Knife Juggler Unleash. Yeah, but the Knife Juggler would just be alive if they played it last turn. No, no, no. I, I, I agree. I'm just <laughs> saying, like, we were looking at Knife Juggler <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Unleash as like, something that was like in the distant future, but it's, they it's, yeah. did, did pan out for them. 
Yeah, it's interesting if that's what they want to do this turn. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to let them get in the hero power, but the kill command is very clean removal on the 5-5 five, five taunt. They can sure. push 5 to face, just take Brown down to 6, and... Still have, yeah. Yeah, but that doesn't really make use out of the knife juggler, which is sort of sitting dead in your hand, so maybe you just want to utilize that for now. Fit in the hero power and hold back the kill command. Mm -hmm. The other consideration, though, is, you know, when's the next time you're going to see a beast? Sure. I All mean, right. it's not the end of the world if you use a three damage kill command, but you know, it is certainly worse. All right, looks like they are going to go with the Unleash the Hounds kill command line. Yep, just one man off being able to, you know, pull off the addition of the Knife Juggler. Still really good, to your point, put him down to six. And the Shaman has to deal with the board. So. Yeah, it, it's just from their perspective, like, how do we die in three turns from here? Yeah. It can happen, but it's going to be tough. The thing from below was a really good pickup. Yeah, no Maelstrom portals in this game, and Maelstrom portal can be a pretty big deal when playing against the aggressive hunter. Yeah, and not Taunt Totem is basically just the only thing here. So Montreal going to be on just a little bit of damage in this game. Wow, Brown pushing out as much damage as possible. Yeah, I think looking at it, you know, you see four damage. Yeah. It's one of those things where it doesn't really change up much, so you might as well just get that little bit of damage in. Mm -hmm. You know, what if you draw something like Bloodlust? You know, everybody damages a consideration. Definitely don't mind it. Yeah, a huge thing that happened in this game was Brown roped out on... Uh, the turn where they had extra mana to play yeah. Spirit Claws. They've missed basically six damage since then. Uh, or maybe just three. Maybe I'm thinking one turn extra. But they uh, yeah, they could be pushing a little more and maybe have been threatening lethal by now. But for Montreal, things are certainly getting dicey now. Mm -hmm. I mean, at this point, if you put down the knife juggler, it is an extra threat that they need to deal with mm -hmm. before you know they can start focusing effort into trying to kill you. And you've dodged, you know, the sweep spells yeah. to this point, so you're pretty sure they don't have them. Mm -hmm. This is definitely a, a little bit of a rough turn. Keep the juggler. You know, you'll if you get a minion next turn, then you have the opportunity to just kill the well, no, because the healing totem, so never mind. Yep. So why do you hold the juggler there? I don't know. Yeah, no. Nothing that stands out to you in terms of why you hold the juggler. Nope. Yeah. I mean if they pick up Unleash the Hounds, they should just be winning the game anyway. You would imagine it's probably gonna manage to push two damage through, but I guess the logic is just playing the juggler is not going to accomplish much. The one thing that springs to mind, even just looking at the hands, is it forces more attacks on your minions if they want to play Ragnaros. So that's nice, but... Yeah, Ragnaros could come down on this turn to easily get rid of the Argent Horse Rider. And I think, I think that's the play I want to see here. Just go ahead and get that down, start doing the damage, set him on basically a two-turn clock. Yeah. And Montreal needs to pick up some extra damage. And it needs to be, it can't be. It can't be Leroy. just damage, yeah. yeah. Has to be something that can go through a taunt. That's not it. Mm -mm. Yeah, so, you know, we talked about this deck can certainly build up a board that does a lot of damage, you know, over turns, and that's exactly what the Shaman has done. Now Ragnar is coming down, just represents eight damage a turn. I was kind of hoping that one juggle would go to uh, to the face, just set him to one, but that's a good juggler. Play. Yeah. All right, so Brown manages to tie it up, and you can see they're all smiles now. Things were looking a little bit tense yeah. after that last loss, but you know nothing restores confidence and friendship like the like the W. Yep. Quirty Homer with some. Great mouse handling skills. Yeah, you know, Cordy Elmer takes uh, takes control, and suddenly, you know, they're winning. Uh, in in most 
situations involving traditional sports. This is exactly how it goes when you get a new coach. You won one game. Good job. You're winning now. Good job, new coach. So uh, one deck remaining for each team. We are going to finally see that Warlock deck, and Montreal is going to have to get it with the Hunter. Now, assuming it is Discard Zoo, I actually like their odds with the Aggressive Hunter. Yeah, I definitely think uh, Aggro Hunter going to do pretty well against Zoo. Yeah. And with the Explosive Traps, with the Unleash the Hounds, it's not as dominating as you'd think, but uh, there's definitely some Zoo draws that can still get there. Imp Gang Boss is still very annoying to deal with. Uh, Defender Vargas, very powerful. But I would still give a little bit of the edge to the Hunter, I think. Yeah, and this is a matchup that really has been going on forever. And mm -hmm. there was a long time where Hunter was extremely favored in this matchup. But yeah, I agree. You know, the the thing about the discard zoo, which has made it so powerful, is the ability to get those crazy turns with Malkazar Zims, uh, you know, Doom Guard, and those big swing turns where you just are able to push damage but keep cards in hand. So it is well, a discard zoo. Brown has a chance to just go for the blowout opener here. It would only be a one out of three to discard the Silverware Golem on turn two with the Librarian, but... Oh, this is also really good because if you were wondering what Discard Zoo is, it seems, here's the primer. <laughs> yeah. It seems like something worth going for, though. I mean, even if you miss the Silverware Golem, you get to cycle a card off the Malkazar Zim. I mean, it just seems kind of like a keepable hand to me. I like it. It's ambitious. It's stylish. Yeah. What, what can Brown do for the viewer? Keep that hand. What can they do for themselves? <laughs> what can they I'll do for you? Yeah. you are not the boss All right, yeah, and they do it. Yep. All right, so we see the potential for double Seeker Keeper, but there's no secrets in hand. Yeah, Montreal could just go for the coin quick shot if they were truly afraid of the Malkazar Zimp immediately. I mean, they would be aware that Brown did keep all three of their cards. Right. Still, I mean, what are the odds you just get absolutely blown out? One out of three in this case. <laughs> that's, I think that's the biggest thing about Malkazar's Imp that I didn't expect, you know, when you first saw it is, that's one of those cards where you look at it and you're like, okay, it's a one three, like it does, you know, what it does there, you mm -hmm. continue to get cards even after you discard cards, but mm -hmm. sometimes it is really just backbreaking. Like that is just this little one drop that you have to deal with mm -hmm. or else you just lose. That's kind of all over the place. Yeah, and from Montreal's perspective, it, it feels kind of miserable to use your coin and a removal spell just to remove a minion, only to be met by another minion next turn and not really have a great play into it. So I'd like to see them go with a proactive line here, develop minions, uh, save the coin, and save their removal for when they'll have things on board to fight. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Direwolf Alpha is really the only thing, well, then the Abusive Sergeant which not all decks are running, but yeah, yeah, and that, uh, for, that deals with it. Well, for Brown, I mean, it's plays off curve. Sure. Feels bad. Yeah, uh, but you get the Hunter off the board. The board is yours. That feels pretty good. But look at that Silverware Golem. I mean... Hear me out, hear me out. Okay. Look at that Silverware Golem. I mean, that's a really compelling argument. That is a... He's is made a, of Silverware. That is a fine-looking Silverware Golem. And when you saw. drop all the Silverware onto the ground, it, it just materializes into a golem somehow. You know, it doesn't happen that way when you drop spaghetti. No. Nope. Nope, it doesn't work like that. All right, well, looks like he's going for the abusive sergeant play. He's just going to play this. Uh, well, nope. Change their mind. Brown has actually become Gul'dan. <laughs> you know, in 100% of the matches today where the team has turned into the hero they're playing, they have won. Yeah. We saw Montreal transcend into Thrall. Uh, it's like a, it's like a, you know, the the meter fills and then you activate your ultimate ability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's how anime works. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it goes to the abusive sergeant. So, to your point, they are playing off curve, but you know, they own that board. No hunters allowed. Okay. Yeah, seems good. Now, Night Juggler is definitely in this matchup. Uh, one thing you want to just you want to keep until you can get kind of a big swing turn with it. Yeah. Uh, Zoo's always putting minions on the board, and with the exception of Imp Gang Boss, there really is no penalty for just throwing knives at minions. So, like the I like not playing it down here, even though you know it looks like from what we can see on the board, uh, they'd have to trade both minions in. Quickly. 
All right, the Malkazar's Imp Dream is dead. Yeah. But the Silverware Golem Dream is alive. No, the Imp Gang Boss on three is a pretty good dream, too. It's a dream we, uh, we often see come true. It's not really that much of a dream. It's just kind of reality. Well, maybe if you're dreaming, like, gosh, I really want it on three, and then you just get it off the top. I, it's it's a low-hanging fruit dream. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, well, unleash the hounds into the hands of Montreal, and they will have the ability at some point to combo Knife Juggler. Unleash the hounds, obviously, that's going to be a five-mana turn. So can't do it right now. And they have to figure out a convenient way to deal with Imp Gang Boss if there is, an e is even one. And that's usually the thing with this minion. There usually isn't. Yeah. There's no convenient way to deal with it. I mean, on turn five, when they have Juggler Unleash, it's going to not be that big of a deal. They can bow into it. A huge concern of theirs is just Defender of Argus, though. Yep. That would make that Imp Gang Boss just kind of turn into just Game. the hardest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very hard minion to remove. Quickly. Yeah, and I feel like this is one of those turns where any play you make, you don't feel good about. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're almost just feeding the Seeker Keeper to the Imp Gang boss at this point. It sets you up for that Unleash later on, but do you want to do that? Do you just Are you just okay with the hero power? That's kind of what they're thinking here. Well, things seem to be lining up pretty nicely now for Brown in the next couple turns. Got that Doom Guard. You still have the Golem in hand. So, yeah, it's a very powerful play uh, going into the Knife Juggler Unleash turn. Doom Guard is big enough I that the knives are probably not going to eat it up. All right, pretty decent haul overall. The cards do very different things. You could just drop down the Possessed Villager now if you wanted to. Same with the Abusive. Power Overwhelming. I don't know that you're necessarily going to keep it with what you have in your hand. But, hey, it's more damage. All facts. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Glad to break it down to a very high level for the audience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so it goes with the Possessed Villager there. Yeah, like I said, being able to just drop it, it sticks to the board, feels pretty good. Well, another awkward turn here for Montreal, not really. Too much doing. Um, they could go ahead and soften up the Imp King boss preemptively for next turn, like quick shot it or kill command it. Um, quick shot would let them get the hero power in. They probably don't want to use the bow right now, and I don't think they really want to throw anything down. That's going to let Brown kind of reduce their board size, which is not what they want. So I'd like to see them throw a burn spell on the Imp Gang boss. Um, let Brown fill up their board and try and swing it back next turn. Yeah, I definitely think that's the way to go. When you look at you know what Brown has, you know, they've already got a pretty intimidating board, and yes, you have Knife Juggler on leash on the next turn, but you know, what is that actually doing against this board? Spawning one one hounds with charge, <laughs> throwing knives that deal one damage. This is also at off, actually random true. enemies. Yep, and. Yeah, that's about it. No, that is the gist. Yep, so sacrificial I'm not knife a huge juggler. fan of the Sacrificial Knife Juggler. Damn. I mean, it's probably going to get traded off, which reduces your opponent's board size, which is exactly what you're not wanting to happen. Now, it's still going to be a six-hound unleash, given that they attack into the Imp Gang boss first. But had they just softened up the Imp Gang boss last turn, they would also have the bow charge to be used on the silverware goal in this turn. Yeah, it really does feel like the Imp Gang boss just kind of locked him out of the game. Yeah, the Imp Gang boss was not able to be dealt with for so long, but this is the swing turn Montreal needs if they're going to come out on top in this one. They need a lot of nice knives here. Yeah, I mean, that. I think prior to the Doom Guard, I would have agreed this is like the swing turn that could turn things around potentially, but. I mean, that 5-7, how do you deal with it? You ignore it. You just let it yeah. over three turns? Yeah, I mean, now Montreal has board control here. They're going to be, uh, you know, Doomguard can't just attack into all of your minions. Nope. So it's kind of a circumstance where they can kill command it off if they need to. They can ignore it if they need to. Sure. 
Uh, they sort of just control the pace of how the rest of this game is going to go. They know what they have to work with uh, in terms of health total and cards. And yeah, it's kind of down to what Brown can pick up uh, from their deck at this point. We saw them pitch a Soulfire last turn. So a little bit of the damage potential gone out of their deck. Well, that's just not intuitive. Two uh, Darkshire Librarians? In the same hand? You don't need them. You don't need both of them. Tell one of them to go home. <laughs> don't come to work today. Yeah. See Seems if they good. can get a silver gold. Nope. Well, they're going to try to save one of them, here. and they got it. So That's just Possessed Villager. Poor guy. Yeah, now, to your point earlier, you know, Doomguard can't fight all of these off by himself, so I kind of like just going and hitting face. Well, it's mostly a case of how concerned are you about the knife juggler effect. Right. Um, Second yeah. unleash would be pretty big. Yeah, so that would hurt. But otherwise, I mean, you are... You do want to push damage, you know. You right. do have to worry about killing uh, the hunter from here because if you don't then the rest of your deck is honestly just weaker than the Hunter deck, and you could get locked out of the game pretty quick. All right, looks like the race is about to be on. Yep. All right, let's go. Fast and Furious. Well, Brown gets a lot of card draw from here, uh, thanks to the two Darkshire Librarians and Life Tap. They could draw up to four cards next turn. Just need to find a way to get nine damage through to win the game. They also need to make sure they stay on board. Uh, you know, the Doom Guard, definitely mm -hmm. that stat line represents a good chance for it, but to your earlier point, Kill Command would make a reasonably short work of it with the Hound, so if they get pushed off the board, then yeah, I think the Aggro Hunter just has a pretty clear line to win. Well, Montreal can just clear with the Argent Horse Rider plus Kill Command this turn, but and that would also kind of get rid of all their board. They wouldn't be pushing face. It's sort of a circumstance of do you take the risk and hope you don't die next turn while also trying to set up lethal? Or do you just go full removal and try and lock out the game on board from there on out? See, I feel like when you're playing against Zoo, you can play a little bit safer and just clear the board. Because again, once they're off the board, you've seen one Soulfire gone, one Doom Guard will be gone. Uh, it's not like they have a ton of damage, it's just appearing out of nowhere. Okay, so Montreal going to go ahead and go with a similar line to what I said, but they're going to play the Secret Keeper over the Argent Horse Rider, so. This gets the minion that would have been worse in their hand on the board, and it keeps the charge in their hand. So you can definitely see where they're going with this. They're choosing to make it a onboard battle and hoping that they can deal with what the zoo produces this turn. So we get it off the peddler. Arcane Anomaly, Possessed Villager, and Flame Imp. Yeah, none of those are spectacular. Well, Arcane Anomaly, you know, represents pretty low value. You're not casting a bunch of spells. So, uh, yeah, Flame he's, Imp. He's the worst. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't want to say it, but. He's yeah. the worst, Rob. He sucks. It's not good. Nope. Nope. You know, I can confidently say that's one of the cards my Karazhan set review was right about, Rob. Was Do you think there was a lot of people just, Arcane Anomaly, it's going to be a game changer. Yes. I want the list of names. Oh, I, I won't name drop anybody, but <laughs> some people thought that card was going to be good. I mean, in Arena? It's not good. Not good. No. In Tavern Brawls? No. Nope. And you're playing with I'd your like friends? I'd like to think, you know, those game modes don't exist. What? Except Heroic Tavern Brawl, Rob. You know, Chalky, I don't want to be the one to tell you this, one. but a lot of people play the game, you know, for fun. Not to be competitive. What? Yeah, it's weird. I don't get it either. Like Although, who? Give me a name. I don't want to name drop anybody. Now. I feel <laughs> like you're gonna I feel like you're gonna sit down and talk to him and be like, listen, it's not a good way to live. The knife juggler's still sticking around. Okay, well, I mean, for this turn, Montreal, they've got three playable cards. They're gonna play them all. Um, I think they should probably make the attack into the I mean, to me, it seems like they're probably leaving that, that Darkshire Councilman alive, right? So they want to make the attack first to increase the chance that they hit these juggles. Well, 
now they have to keep it alive. So Brown just needs a little bit of damage. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a little bit of damage. Uh, not enough, though. Well, you said a little bit. I think they're one off. Because I think the Crazed Alchemist effect resolves before the Darkshire Councilman effect. So it'd become a 5-4, then a 6-4. You Argus it, and it would have eight attack total. So, unfortunate. Yeah, and if you tap, I mean, you're still, you know, sitting on Defender of Argus, Crazed Alchemist, probably, unless... I think there's a direwolf in there still. Direwolf wouldn't do it though. No. So they're gonna need like Soulfire, Doomguard. Abusive Sergeant would do it. I mean, you're staring down seven damage on the board, the hero power. You know, I think you probably feel pretty safe to tap. And pretty safe, I mean, you just kind of have to go for it. And Flame Imp always arriving when you have too little health. Feels bad, man. Right, still putting together a pretty big uh, wall there. Let's see. From what we can see, you know, the hunter can't actually get through it. Well, I think Brown, Brown sort of needed to make that attack, but they made the read that it's freezing trap. See, I'd be much more willing to say, okay, it's probably not. That, that was just a random trap. They happened to top deck last turn. They would play it no matter what just to get the Secret Keeper buff. But based off of the way the juggles kind of went, it sort of looked like Montreal was like, yeah, we'll leave this up, isolate it, let Freezing Trap deal with it. But in reality, they were just like, we have literally no way to kill that. <laughs> we have a plan. <laughs> we totally have a plan. So things get interesting now. Are they just going to die? They can kill the uh, the Dark Share Councilman, which they need to do not to die. <laughs> so weirded out by that stat line on Argent Horse Rider now. Like I just have never seen it as a one-two. My brain keeps like double checking. Like is that even possible? Yeah, got a uh, young priestess buff. And then it got humility. Getting too uppity. All right. Well, gonna try and bluff the explosive. And it's not quite enough still. Oh, oh, it actually is. If they do this correctly. All right, how do they do it correctly? So it's weird because their secret's up, right? They could be explosive, but if you go Doom Guard, and then you attack in with your Crazed Alchemist, which then Freezing Traps it back for four mana. You have four mana left. You can swap your Doomguard to a 7-5. Seven, seven attack Doomguard, two attack Argus. That's nine. That's game. Shocky, you're brilliant. Now that's Caster Vision. They obviously have to play around these secrets. Um, chose to go ahead and figure out the secrets first. But, I mean, that was kind of just a consideration as far as if you think one of them is Freezing, I mean, it's it's a pretty solid plan to win. Of course, if the other one's explosive, it doesn't work out. Yeah. And that's why they uh, made that attack first. So we've got another kind of awkward scenario. Now, unfortunately for Montreal, Cat Trick is doing Cat Trick things against Zoo. <laughs> it's just, just nothing. Just nothing. Absolutely nothing. Ah, oh, poor Flame. Flame was like, you can play me. One mana. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Lethal. <laughs> All right, well, that is not going to do it. Yeah, Montreal going to drop the set. Brown makes the comeback. It was a very, uh, very close series, though. Ba very back and forth. Definitely feel like Brown kind of righted the ship. Uh, you know, <laughs> All right, Brown's very excited about winning, but yeah, once they had a change of who was handling the, the mouse and keyboard, things turned around. That was it. Maybe yep. adjusted the DPI, yeah. got the sensitivity lowered. Look, the guy who has the mouse in that situation ultimately makes the final call. You know, you can, your friends can give you all the opinions they want to, but you know, you're just like, I'm sorry, I'm driving. That, that's actually what I did at fight night. Uh, like we, we had a pretty clear way to win and, you know, Forsen and Darkonix were kind of arguing over it. And I, I just grabbed the mouse and did it. So congratulations to Brown. They have qualified for the single elimination playoffs a little bit later in the season. 
Uh, you know, not the end of the world for Montreal. I, like I said, I was actually really impressed in general with how mm -hmm. they played. I think they had a very good understanding of their matchups, and they did some pretty clever stuff with the Hunter deck. Very excited to see how they progress later on in T or sorry, Tespa training grounds. Yeah, uh, definitely think we could see them in the playoffs. Unfortunately, it was the Hunter deck that kind of failed them there, going 0-3 yeah. in that series. Had to make a lot of cute plays to stay in the games, but the trap draws were not on point at the end there. Um, unfortunate for them. Brown looked pretty excited about their win, and I'd just like to mention Math Majors now 1-0, Rob. I mean, you did toss out a statistic where every single team that had become a hero portrait, you know, statistically yeah, was... that too. Didn't happen. Though. I got they all... both, Yeah, they both no. turned into it. They turned into the Hunter at the end. Oh, did they? Yeah. Uh, so I walk away with something. And production is just trying to scam me. I'll take the consolation prize. Anyway, eager to know what you all at home thought of that series, what you thought of the teams, and you know how far they're going to go in the single elimination playoffs. Let us know. Head on over to Facebook at facebook.com slash Team Tespa, or hit us up on Twitter at, at Team Tespa. I want to take a moment to thank the sponsors who helped make Training Grounds possible. Thank you, Twitch, Gunner, and Steel Series. We're going to throw to a quick break. We'll be right back with our next series.